right. Good morning. Welcome, Dr. Price. Thank you for joining me on uh, Pulling the Threads podcast again this time. Um, how are you doing this oh, morning? That's great fun. Thanks. So, um, so, yeah, today I wanted to, like last time we kind of talked about Christ mythology and historical versus mytholo- the myth- mythicist view. Today I kind of wanted to ask you questions about the origins of Christianity. Uh, who is Paul? You wrote a book on the colossal apostle. Um, Gabriel Boccaccini has wrote works that he refers to Paul as kind of in the vein of Enochian Judaism, a branch of Hellenistic Judaism, uh, kind of based within the Enochian literature. Can you uh, give me some background on, I guess, like who you see Paul as and kind of where he falls within, I guess, you know, Gabriel Boccaccini's view of like Enochian Judaism and where his writings come out of? Uh, Well, the the, uh, Enochian thing is really interesting. Like the Dead Sea Scrolls seem to participate in that thought world. And uh, as does the Gospel of John, uh, but it's uh, it's a little tougher to see the Paul of the epistles uh, as uh, fitting as easily into that. He doesn't speak of the son of man. He doesn't use the same sort of metaphors, the symbols of uh, uh, the, the animals standing for the different leaders of Israel and other nations. Uh, he doesn't, he's somewhat interested in angels and usually they're malevolent ones. And, uh, and then the, uh, we, we know that, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls people and uh, the uh, people that treasured the various books of Enoch, of which there were many. I mean, the, the, our first Enoch is a Pentateuch, actually, of five originally different writings. And then there is the uh, the Slavonic Enoch, which may have been written slightly later, uh, which I think is more of a unitary work. Uh, and then there is the uh, couple of centuries later, third Enoch or Hebrew Enoch. And then we're told there were several other ones uh, that some more are mentioned in the testaments of the 12 patriarchs and so on. And from what I remember, angels there are uh, in, in, in that whole tradition are uh, good. And uh, the, the armies of God, which of course you would expect from the uh, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, but in the Pauline epistles, it sounds more Gnostic to me um, in that uh, there the angels mentioned are in, in a group of the principalities, powers, dominions, thrones, and all this, uh, which Paul uh, speaks of, like in Romans, is those entities which would separate us from God, uh, but for Christ, uh, managing to uh, to break through and be our advocate. Uh, he speaks of lustful angels in 1 Corinthians, that that's his final big reason Corinthian women should uh, go veiled, uh, because otherwise uh, they may be attracting the uh, frisky attentions of angels, just like Eve did when she was unveiled completely in the garden. And uh, so, and yet, uh, of course, uh, Enoch knows of the watchers as fallen angels. So it's not like that's totally alien, but they seem to be more active in Paul, like still up to their old mischief. But these are these might be judged in a larger framework as variations of a theme, just different emphases according to what each seer or uh, thinker uh, visualizes as important. Now, I t- I kind of go through a back door into seeing a real connection between Paul and uh, this kind of sectarian Judaism. Uh, when I uh, say, as I argue in The Amazing Colossal Apostle, that Paul was another name for the guy we know uh, as Simon Magus, uh, things said about Simon and his relation to the sect of John the Baptist, uh, that he was the uh, the 
the would be I should say he was slated to be the successor of John but was away in Egypt when John died and for the lack of him they demoted number two in line Dosithius the Samaritan to be the head of the sect when John the Baptist sorry when uh, when Simon returned he said uh, uh, what where's John up oh, sorry he passed away but Dosithius is in charge and he says oh he is huh and he he managed to uh, uh, be a good sport about it for a while, but came to be disillusioned with Dositheus and challenged him to, to a kind of a miracle contest. Uh, and uh, it, it, who could be like docetic uh, and, and polymorphous and kind of transcend the flesh. And in a kind of a duel with Dositheus, Dositheus yielded and said, all right, I got to admit it, you're the standing one, which is sort of a Gnostic uh, synonym for, for uh, the great power of God. And however, uh, he, he uh, must have split with them eventually. And this it really looks that way if you go with Robert Eisenman, as I do, and think that uh, the sect of John described in the pseudo-Clementines was the same as the Qumran community, and by extension, the same as the Jerusalem congregation. Uh, now, we hear that um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, though, of course, they're written in cipher language, so you never really can be sure who they're talking about. But it, it, I find Eisenman very plausible that uh, that the individual called the spouter of lies or the mocker uh, was kicked out of the community because he was uh, trying to make things easy for the simple ones of Ephraim, who seemed to be uh, Gentiles, by saying, oh, you can join the covenant too, and you don't uh, have to worry about all those strict things that the, the, the Qumran monks uh, do. Uh, and uh, to the Qumran elders, of which there were 12, interestingly, uh, they uh, said, no, 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 you're, you're just deluding these people. You're selling smooth things. Uh, it, it's, gonna, it's cheap grace, as Bonhoeffer would have called it. And uh, you're building a city on blood, a phrase that occurs in the scrolls. So he, uh, he left or was kicked out and said he, he was, I think, uh, expelled from the covenant for having denied the covenant itself. Uh, and so to me, this sounds a lot like the uh, pseudo-Clementine story of Simon Magus mm -hmm. and uh, the, the sect of John. And yet there is also this interesting thing in Galatians, which seems to remember that Paul uh, managed to to reconcile with the, uh, the, the Jerusalem pillars, uh, the big three whom I identify with the three uh, men of the inner circle at, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they said, look, th they needed the money. Uh, they were uh, a small group. They had a kind of socialist communitarianism that, that'll bankrupt any group that tries it. And so they were the poor, the Ebionites also. And Paul, apparently, or Simon, was having great uh, success among the Gentiles, uh, partly by altering the nature of the preaching uh, to something that, that they could make more sense of, like Jesus as a mystery religion savior. I, I This gets really messy, but uh, mm -hmm. Irenaeus tells us that Simon claimed to have appeared as Jesus earlier and to have apparently suffered on the cross, though in fact he hadn't, and uh, that uh, he had been active in the Old Testament period uh, as, as the father. Uh, when he was Jesus, he was the son, and now he's the spirit. Well, my guess is that the Qumran slash Jerusalem church had no uh, Jesus figure originally, um, though they did have a leader. So they sort of had a, a, a hole to fill there, and that to have this rapprochement with uh, with Simon, he said, all right, uh, let's get back together, but I'm not going to change my gospel 
but uh, how about you give me your blessing to go preach it to the Gentiles, whom you're not preaching to anyway. Uh, I mean, the, think of Matthew 10. Uh, their great commission was, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, only the lost sheep of Israel. Well, okay. Well, as in Galatians said, they decided Peter would go to the circumcised, me to the uncircumcised. But this didn't, oh yeah, and part of his price was you have to uh, accept uh, me as the Messiah, uh, at least in the first go-round. Uh, and uh, that's kind of why the 12, whose names, at least the three, their titles in the Gospels implied they had cosmic significance. Peter, the rock, presumably the the, the cosmic uh, navel stone of the temple uh, that, that kept the floodwaters in check. James and John, the uh, Boanerges, who I think have, has to do with uh, Boaz and Jake and the two great pillars, which stand for the pillars that hold up the, the vault of, of the uh, heavens. And so they were uh, cosmic uh, entities. And and, um, uh, but they get shoved aside in the Gospels. And why is that? Well, because when the Gospels were written, they gave pride of place to Simon's uh, Jesus and made his lieutenants the, uh, in the, the, the 12 disciples who had been really the, uh, the 12 councilmen of Qumran. And the inner circle became the pillars. Okay, and uh, they were still sort of important, but they suffer in comparison with Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, it seems to me, that, and then the whole thing fell apart because of what we also read in Galatians, that uh, the, uh, the uh, Jerusalem church must have begun to think, wait a minute, maybe we can eliminate the middleman. Uh, how about if we go around to these churches Paul founded, or Simon, take your pick, uh, and tell them, you're off to a good start, brethren, but I'm afraid Paul only taught you the beginning of it. If you want to really go the whole way, of course, you've got to be circumcised and keep the Torah. And some of them said, well, that's reasonable. I mean, uh, if Jesus was Jewish, uh, it would make sense. We follow the Jewish law. And uh, so Paul, they do this after Paul is left, and he uh, finds out about it and said, what is going on here? You guys are knifing me in the back. And that's certainly the way he seems to put it in Galatians. I thought we had a deal. What, what is this? Uh, in fact, if you follow this route, you're cutting yourself off from Christ. Uh, you're, you're saying he died for nothing. Uh, if if nothing has changed. And so whoosh, uh, the uh, temporary reconciliation came apart. And uh, and in this uh, is very complicated, and I realize the more links you have in a chain of hypotheses, uh, the less uh, probable it becomes. And so it's it's a reconstruction. It's a possible way of looking at it. You can never be sure that this is true. So I'm not getting on my high horse about it, my hobby horse. It's, oh, yeah, we know this is true. And if you don't think so, you're no scholar. It's baloney. Uh, I, I agree. I admit, but it, this does seem to me to be a compelling way of putting together a lot of bits and pieces that otherwise just all seem very strange and hard to put into the conventional orthodox view of Christian origins. Uh, and uh, so, um, and, and ultimately to skip ahead, it seems to me that Christianity as it emerged as Catholicism was ultimately the, the result of three sort of later developments, three forms of Christianity, uh, well, pre-Christianity, the sacramental system seems to me to have come directly from the mystery religions, because from what we hear about early Christian worship, uh, they were a mystery religion. Uh, you had to have catechism before you could be baptized, and only then could you have communion, and this enabled you to participate in the saving death and resurrection of Jesus. You know, you might as well be talking about Mithras or something there. Uh -huh. Same kind of thing. Uh, so that was important. Uh, second, the the cults of the dying and rising gods, which were which 
fit very well into the mystery religion, but was technically sort of a different mytheme that originally had to do with agriculture and the re renewal of nature. And before that, the Israelite sacred king who ritually went through a death and resurrection to restore the fertility of the land and his mandate of heaven to rule, et cetera, et cetera. A and then uh, the uh, and Gnosticism was uh, kind of a variation on that, uh, where you had to have a saving knowledge, uh, which is certainly why even today, though Christians say that, oh, they hate Gnosticism, that was a heresy. It's obvious to any outsider that you their belief that you have to believe a certain dogma. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. You have to have the saving knowledge. And I, I guess I would say also you can add a fourth thing, the hero cult, because the way Jesus is depicted in the Gospels, he's like Hercules or Apollonius of Tyana. He does wonders, and it's even the same mythic hero archetype, one type scene after another that you also find with the Buddha and Oedipus and Hercules and so on. Uh, even, and this, I think, was the original point of the death and resurrection. It's amazing how little the Gospels have to say about the death of Jesus as an atonement. You have that in the epistles. But uh, in the Gospels, it's mainly you can't keep a good man down. The crucifixion, the Judas's betrayal, it's all the darkness before the dawn. Whammo, he, he's back. Hey, you enemies thought you could stop him, but as Peter says in the book of Acts, but God overruled you. And that really has nothing to do with this atonement. That's plugged in from the, the mystery religions, it seems to me. So again, that's a like a geyser full of uh, uh, gibberish, probably, but that's how I view Christian origins, my working hypothesis. Well, no, that was that was really good. Um, so. Um... You, you said mentioned three layers. I kind of see, I guess, four layers of redaction, I would say, or four errors of redaction mm -hmm. that, that in the formation. For me, uh, the post-destruction um, of the Temple of the Bar Kokhba is an era where I think you see the pro-Roman influence, the give unto Caesar. And then a, I think a big one, and I kind of want to ask you questions a little bit later on this, but would be like Marcion. And his influence, and then the in the in the next layer would be the proto-orthodox response, which then leads up to the final layer, which I see as Roman Catholicism. Uh, before I ask you questions on that, because that's kind of like my view of how some of the formations there, uh, which might be kind of wild, but I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of want to go back to the Simon Magus thing mm -hmm. um, before kind of getting into some of that. Uh, the polemic work Taldu Yeshu speaks of Simon Magus as a double agent, and I've seen some work that questions whether Paul actually had a conversion or found a different way to influence uh, the community. To be. His his views seem more akin to Philo, and the the question like that I have that I I don't believe the statement that's attributed that he was a student of Gamaliel. Because his his views seemed to more align with Philo than they would Gamaliel, from my understanding. So, um, and I guess that's a lot. I kind of went on a rabbit trail too there. But no, no. Uh, Simon Magus, uh, uh, Paul, as you know, the name changer who maybe was a double agent, still with a view to influence the people to be more pro-Roman. Uh, what do you? take of that and was do you see him as a disciple of Gamaliel or not I think you're right about that that that's part of the Judaizing Catholicizing emphasis of Luke uh, who I think was actually uh Polycarp of Smyrna I think it's a second century work and that the Theophilus to whom his works are addressed is the bishop of the, uh, the bishop of Antioch Theophilus uh who was Polycarp's uh colleague but um I agree, like uh, Haim Maccabee points out in a couple of his books, uh, like uh, one of them is Paul and Hellenism. He says, if Paul, well, he thought he did take Paul to be the actual author of the epistles. I don't. Um, I think it gets more complicated than that. But nonetheless, whoever wrote them uh, seems to just have the vaguest uh, 
acquaintance with Judaism, the way scripture is treated, as Maccabee points out, sounds more like the Nag Hammadi texts uh, than uh, rabbinic stuff. Uh, I remember years ago, I finally got around to reading W.D. Davies' book, Paul and uh, Rabbinic Judaism? I'm, I'm... Oh, man, or maybe just Paul. Oh, I can't remember now. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in it, this this is supposed to be the big classic that shows just how Jewish Paul's thought was, again, based on the canonical epistles. I read it and I thought, what? Am I reading the same book? Uh, th this does not seem to make its case at all. In fact, it's almost a refutation of what people say about it, because uh, the closest he comes to anything in the Pauline epistles is the idea of the good and evil inclinations, uh, and uh, that that's kind of like where Paul says, I know that sin dwells within me and all this. There's another law in my members, but I don't think it's the same thing. Uh, it's... Uh, it's it's not really the 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 meat of the Pauline doctrine uh, that I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Uh, who will release me from this bondage of death? Uh, that um, seems to me that and when he in Romans seven, uh, he's uh, talking about the lot of the uh, of the. Uh, unregenerate. I mean, he seems to be more of a perfectionist. And uh, this this just doesn't sound rabbinic to me at all, and certainly not the... Uh, I mean, he quotes the Septuagint or translates it into Greek himself. The, the uh, guys in Palestine had a funeral for the Torah when the Septuagint was published. <laughs> It's like uh, Mark 7 quoting Jesus debating with the scribes over uh, Pazaya, uh, and Jesus' point depends on quoting the Greek Septuagint because the Hebrew text doesn't say the same thing. And so you're supposed to accept Jesus having a debate with the rabbis from the Septuagint? No, no. Uh, I, I think it's all Hellenized, but uh, Luke acts uh, Ephesians, First and Second Peter, uh, and um, well, maybe a couple other ones are are Catholicizing documents, as F. C. Bauer pointed out, because there, it's it's ill concealed that they're trying to make Paul sound like. Peter and Jesus sound like Stephen, and Paul sound like Stephen, and uh, the Jesus and Peter have the same career uh, issuing in the an arrest at the temple and uh, trials before Herodian monarchs and and so on and so on, uh, and the they're even. Paul's mentioned by name, of course, in 2 Peter, that, uh, yeah, I know Paul, a lot of people are getting weird stuff out of reading Paul, but uh, granted, it's it's difficult material, and the unstable nuts out there twist the text, but our brother Paul, oh, he he was, if you read him right, uh, you know, he's a good guy, and uh, after all, it's nothing new for people to, to misinterpret scripture. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're thinking of Paul's epistles as scripture and you're the apostle Peter? No, no. Uh, this is a later attempt to merge the two together. And you can read Ephesians and First Peter uh, the same way. And but especially Luke and Acts, uh, it, where Paul does the charade to make it look like he, uh, you know, when he's paying for the haircuts for the guys who are, are finishing up their vow and all this stuff. And, and it's even put as if this, of course, is is a scam, right, Paul? Uh, but but maybe it'll convince <laughs> Uh, it, it just seems to me that that stuff is no evidence for what Paul was like. And one last thing, and I'll shut up about this, uh, no conversion. I, th I think it is very important that if, if Paul's conversion is told three times with somewhat different details in Acts, of course. Uh, and uh there, there's almost two more versions because 
the whole thing seems to me to be derived from two well-known, already old sources, uh, Euripides' play, The Bacchae, uh, in which uh, Pentheus, uh, the, uh, the king of uh, Thebes, I guess it is, is trying to uh, persecute the, the new religion of Dionysus, which has just infiltrated the city. And he has Dionysus uh, jailed. He doesn't realize that that, that Dionysus' apostle is really Dionysus uh, in disguise. And he has a miraculous prison escape, and he tells uh, Pentheus, you think you have power over me? You don't. Uh, it's uh, He tells him pretty much what Jesus tells Pilate, you'd have no power over me unless it was, you're, you're just playing a role here. Uh, and then he, he miraculously sort of hypnotizes Pentheus, said, wouldn't you like to join the group uh, yeah, yeah, I would. Uh, and he says, okay, you're going to have to dress up as a woman because my followers are all women. And if you want to go check them out, you want to be in disguise. Uh, okay, he does. And he climbs a tree to observe them having their crazy rituals. And they recognize him and tear him to pieces, limb from limb. And, uh, and and uh, Dionysus has already said to the audience, "Now we'll say if he see if he can take it as well as dish it out." Well, this is just what happens to Paul. He's persecuting the Christians, and and suddenly he has this. And well, actually, the the rest of the story, the miraculous escape, and all that that's in chapter sixteen. But uh, he he does become a Christian. Uh, he does get persecuted before it uh, for it, and finally dies. But there's even a scene where the risen Jesus appears to Ananias and makes the same kind of nasty remark. Now he'll see how much he has to suffer for my name. Yikes. Well, the other source is 2 Maccabees chapter 3, where Heliodorus, an official of uh, the Seleucid emperor, uh, is, is put in charge of a raid on the Jerusalem temple. We could use that money. Those, those Jews don't need it. Why don't you go down there and sack the place? Well, he does it, but he doesn't actually get there because at, in front of the temple, an angel appears on horseback and tramples him, and he's knocked out and uh, blinded. And uh, the Jewish elders say, oh boy, we're going to answer for this. Let's nurse this guy back to health. And so they do, and uh, he, he regains his sight, and he pretty much converts to Judaism and goes back to the emperor and, and says, says, like, here's what happened. That's why I'm empty handed. And so, well, well, what would you suggest that I get another guy to do? He says, well, if you want him to get pulled and to convert to Judaism, you could have him try it. Uh, wait a second. What? And these were well-known works. It just seems to me, and you look at the epistles, there's not a word about this. Uh, it, it says at one point, when it pleased God to reveal his son to me or in me, uh, which kind of fits the context better, uh, then, okay, I began preaching, et cetera, et cetera. But there's nothing about Damascus Road. There are various remarks about him executed the church, but every one of these seems textually dubious. Uh, J.C. O'Neill did a great little book on this, showing that it, some of the bits are using alien vocabulary to their their context they seem to be interpolations uh and 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 so forth so i, I wrote a one of my chapters is the legend of paul's conversion and in fact, in Romans 16, he or somebody pretending to be Paul speaks of, I think it's Andronicus and Junius, notable among the apostles who were in my kinsmen who were in Christ before me. What? This guy comes from a family of Christians? Uh, uh, hold on. What, what are we talking about here? Uh, and then you think of what the Ebionites said, that, that Paul was a Gentile who converted to Judaism because he uh, had the hots for the high priest's daughter, but he just couldn't hack it. And so they kicked him out and he said, they're going to be sorry they did this. I'm going to... Uh, 
destroy Judaism and siphon off the Congress. Was that true? Well, I don't know. But how come? I mean, it's hard otherwise to explain how he speaks of the law as a terrible burden. Jews don't think that. Jews never thought that. Uh, if, if that's what Gentile would-be converts thought. Right? That's why in the epistles it says, hey, don't put a false stumbling block in the path of these dumb pagans. This stuff is all natural for you, circumcision, kosher, and all that. But but it's you're asking them to change their whole lifestyle. What's important, that stuff or Christ? Uh, I mean, it's uh, that sounds like either he knows very well where they're at or he's there. Uh, he says, when among Jews, I uh, behaved as a Jew. You mean it was just uh, a strategy? W what does he mean? He says, when with Gentiles, I behaved as one of them. Well, that kind of throws them both on a par. Which was he? So I, I don't think it's at all clear. Uh, who Paul was, but my guess is he was Simon Magus. And one last thing, the church fathers all said Simon Magus was the father of all heresies, especially Gnosticism. Well, mm -hmm. what do you know? The Gnostics said that Paul was, uh, yeah, they said Simon was the father of all the heresies, but the Gnostics said Paul was the father of all the heresies. Well, maybe that's because they're talking about the same guy. And as Bauer pointed out, even in Acts, it's pretty obvious that Simon is supposed to be Paul, crassly trying to buy apostleship, recognition from Peter, uh, and with money and so on. Uh, so much of it is still vague, but a lot of it comes together. Uh, and I think it's like where you see the vultures circling, that's where you'll find the body. Yeah. Well, I think the passage you mentioned uh, where I think it's a confession, uh, it's the smoking gun where he says, I, you know, I become a Jew amongst Jews and a Gentile among Gentiles. I think that's the smoking gun of like, yeah, he he becomes what he needs to uh, to people. Um, so you mentioned first Peter and it seems to have a pro Pauline perspective yet. If you look at the uh, secret epistle of James or what's called the epistle of Peter to James, he's referred to as the enemy. So I, I have a hard time squaring first Peter with what I would say the historical Peter, who I'd see in the tradition of the Ebionites, uh, James the Just, uh, who would see him as a heretic uh, because the Ebionites rejected Paul and saw him as a heretic. I have a hard time squaring first Peter uh definitely with what i would see uh now the pseudo clementine literature i think may reflect like an earlier more authentic tradition um mm -hmm. as a lot of texts we don't have uh the original text so you know it seems like it has layers of catholic redaction in there maybe um what are your views i guess of the pseudo clementine literature the authentic, the uh, authentic nature, maybe of like the Epistle of Peter to James, uh, the DDK, I think reflect it's a uh, may reflect an earlier tradition mm -hmm. um, of the community, say of James, Peter, John, uh, those who kind of remained within Judaism, versus Paul who went his own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right about that. Uh, one giveaway for that is the way the Eucharist is handled. There is nothing about the death of Jesus or atonement. Rather, the uh, the bread drawn together from wheat from all over the, the hills and all that, it's like the, uh, the unity of the community. But there's nothing about the saving death of Jesus, yet Jesus is mentioned. He's important. Uh, well, thank you for your servant, Jesus, and your servant, David, and all that. So they do sound like uh, sort of lightly Christianized Jews, uh, the kind you would sort of expect from the book of Acts. Uh, I think the... Uh, like uh, most scholars that I know of think that the 
that there is a second century section of the pseudo Clementines, which they call the the Ebionite Acts, and that's where you have the debate between Peter and Simon Magus, uh, where Simon sounds like Paul and like Marcion, especially. Um, and I think that is more uh, of the the historical situation. And the third Peter, as I like to call it, the Epistle of Peter to James, uh, that is is more of an Ebionite thing, and and uh, it could well be authentic. It shares the the notion of of James as the the head of the, as the master of the missionaries uh, with the Gospel of Thomas. We know that you will depart from us. To whom should we go? And he says, wherever you come from, apparently from missionary journeys, you will report to James the righteous, uh, for whom for whose sake heaven and earth were created. I think that's uh, a character much like the elder in the the so called Johannine epistles. Uh, well. If, uh, First Peter, I think, does not in any way represent um, the the historical Peter. It's an attempt to counter that stuff. So no wonder it doesn't fit. And the same darn thing with with Second Peter, which was is is a pseudonymous sequel to the pseudonymous First Peter. And I mean, it slaps you in the face with pro-Paulinism, because that's the one where, oh yeah, our brother Paul, writer of scripture, and I'll get out of here. Uh, and I, Bauer's paradigm just seems to me to be vindicated anew all the time. Okay, yeah. Um, so, my next question is maybe in the realm of conspiracies. I don't know. Um, was Paul a real person? Um, uh, so there's some things. It seems like there's some similar similarities in the embellished story about Paul, where he was in the wilderness for three years. Josephus was in the wilderness for three years. Was Paul an in literary invention of Marcion or somebody in the second century? Um, because I see potential, at least story layers brought from different things that made up who Paul was. And the first uh, copies of Paul's letter we have are found conveniently by Marcion. Uh, did he find them or did he invent them? Um, yeah. And <laughs> where do you see the uh, those embellished stories? Uh, he was a student of Gamaliel, the three years in the wilderness. I mean, where did all this come from? Um, well, uh, some of it, well, like the, the conversion comes, I think, from 2nd Maccabees and uh, the, the Bacchae. It's been suggested that at least part of the travel narrative of Paul comes from uh, traditions of Apollonius of Tyana, who goes to the same string of cities in the same order. Now, that doesn't prove anything, but it's kind of striking. Uh, it's possible Paul is another version of, of a sort of a nickname for Apollonius, but I've never been able to nail that down. I've I've read it suggested a couple times, and I, I asked the gang at the Jesus Seminar, does anybody know if, if this is, if Paul is a short version? Nobody really, they all confessed ignorance. So I don't know if it's even possible to find out, but that could be... Uh, uh, I think there's uh, there's stuff that comes from the Gospels, possibly. I mean, the passion narrative of Paul so closely parallels that of Jesus, especially in Luke's Gospel, that you wonder. I mean, on that basis, some people have argued that um, that uh, Paul and Jesus were two names for the same guy. I believe um, Lena Einhorn. Right. I think it's Lena Einhorn argues that in a couple of books. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, it is striking that there are so many similarities there um, with Josephus, um, another gutsy writer, Ralph Ellis. Uh, is, is a lot of people dismiss this guy as a nut. I, I don't share that view, even when I don't agree with him. Uh, I'm grateful for his pushing the envelope. And uh, it's like uh, Poe says in The Raven, he dreamt dreams no mortal ever dreamt before. And and he he's uh, he's 
fascinating uh, in his his historical reconstructions. Again, I don't buy them all. But for instance, he says that Paul and Josephus were the same guy, and he points to a number of parallels. And I said, well, I find that a little hard to accept, but you're on to something. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that Acts, which it seems pretty obvious, used Josephus, and Luke used Josephus. Well, maybe uh, he filled in part of the, the life of Paul from Josephus, and that's why they're so similar. But my guess is the historical Paul was Simon Magus um, because um, uh, Josephus tells us that in the circle of um, Agrippa, uh, I mean, I mean uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I guess it was uh, Herod Agrippa II, um, Felix, Festus, Drusilla, Bernice, and all these people, they had a kind of Rasputin figure, uh, a, a sort of sage, wizard, astrologer guy that uh, hung around with him. And uh, he was named Simon. And, uh, and Paul is associated with these people, too. And, uh, and he was supposed to be a miracle worker and so forth. And once you accept that, you begin to wonder, well, Simon supposedly went to Egypt to, to learn magic or whatever. Paul supposedly did miracles. And Ben Stada, mentioned by the rabbis, went to Egypt and uh, and and so forth. Uh, so, oh man, or the Egyptian, he may have been him, and he also went to, so uh, it seems to me that uh, there is a pretty good case, and I mean, it's circumstantial evidence, but that's all you got, so it has to condition your dogmatism on it, but it seems to me, I could, like in the book, I go into other weird stuff that kind of fits, like even from the Toledo of Yeshu, uh, but uh uh, it makes the most sense to me of, of other stuff that really doesn't make any particular sense if you isolate it and make it just an, an anomaly or an aberration. Uh, so uh, that I find that pretty compelling, but who knows? Um, okay, so talking about Christian origins, um, I mean, so... The chicken or the egg, which came first, the gospel or the epistles. Um, and kind of back to a statement I said earlier, I think that the early stage of like the layers of redaction would have been the pro-Roman era, uh, po post-destruction of the temple before Bar Kokhba, kind of the Flavian era. Um, and that's kind of where we have the pro-Roman redaction. And yes, that's, I, that's yeah, where I forgot I see that. Paul. You're right. That's where I see Paul. Uh, yeah, I, see I think Paul that's coming correct. in there, and that's where the question I guess I'm getting to is that um he his I don't believe his conversion I feel like his message was uh Hellenistic you know to pull away the Jewish zealots into a pacifistic religion um and I'll couch it with this the the people with the money and the wealth to produce and distribute would have the power to edit and i would say that would be the elite class in rome what do you see in like the distribution of paul's letters and a final thing uh because i know it's a lot the the clementine homilies to me kind of give proof that there was a conflict between two communities so i wouldn't completely say paul was totally fabricated somebody simon magus or paul existed and there was a conflict um so i wouldn't say he was completely made up but marcion i think may have influenced his letters a lot um, what do you make of, I guess, the uh, that first phase of Christian formations and, and Paul's influence on that? Well, I do think uh, the earliest Christianity was some kind of uh, um, Qumran type uh, Jewish uh, apocalypticism, uh, per perhaps uh, very likely stemming from the Essenes. I read an interesting thing about uh, the origins of Lord's Supper, how it seems to fit better with the every 50-day 
celebration of Pentecost as the giving of the law at Qumran, it fits that better than the Passover. It's been changed, and, and it looks like, yeah, Renan was right. It started as an Essenism. But uh, by the time you get to uh, Paul, it, it does seem to be Roman accommodationist. And uh, and uh, the uh, the thing with the Gospels and the Epistles, I don't know if we can ever say which was first. They could be contemporary, because it, I think Schmittholz may have suggested this, that the non-historical Jesus tendency of the Epistles may have come at any point from a community that never believed in a historical Jesus. So they had, they quoted no sayings. They didn't know them. Uh, and they, they weren't coined yet, maybe. Uh, and there weren't any stories until Marcion and others began rewriting the Old Testament to make it into gospel stories. And uh, they rejected the Old Testament ostensibly, but they kind of liked a lot of it and rewrote it as Jesus material. Um, and um, Paul represents, the Pauline tradition seems to represent a, a, a tradition where they didn't understand there had been a historical Jesus. Uh, and the, uh, um, but the, uh, the uh, Marcionites or others yeah, it must have been some kind of Marcionites in order to salvage what they could of the Old Testament was to Christianize it. Uh, the Catholic Christians Christianized it simply by reinterpreting it. Oh, this is a hidden pr prediction of uh, Jesus and all that. But I think Marcionites, uh, I, I tend to think, I go along with, uh, um, he wrote uh, Marcion and the Dating of the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Marcus Vincent, that's it. Uh, and that he says that Marcion wrote the first gospel and that uh, he wrote it, and he has interesting arguments for this. He said that he wrote it as a kind of, by rewriting the, the Old Testament uh, stories. And he made copies of it for his students, that it was very much like a modern graduate seminar. I mean, we know these guys had groups, circles of students like Aristotle and Plato did. And uh, that he said, don't, you know, not for circulation. Uh, let's study this. But the, the students loved this and said, well, I, I'm afraid I can't help share the good news. And mm -hmm. said, you got to see this. And so it began to spread without Marcion's knowledge. And other people said, uh, I like this, but I think it could be even better, which is how you get Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, and, and eventually John. And that uh, this finally comes to uh, uh, Marcion's attention and and if this seems historically implausible and conspiratorial, it's not much different than the scenario implied in Third John, right? Where where uh, suddenly it comes to the elders' attention that people representing him have been teaching docetism in his name. And he says, "Wait a minute." Uh, we never sent these people out. Uh, if somebody tries this, slam the door. Well, it's that kind of thing that you could easily imagine it being done behind the, the big guy's back. And once he finds out about it, what does he do? He said, well, the cat's out of the bag now. Uh, I'm going to have to publish this, but let me revise it. And apparently he said some of the stuff in these pirate editions was pretty good. Let's add it in, uh, and uh, that and his. I, I can't explain them at, at the moment, but I, I found the arguments. It has to do with uh, comparing the readings of different uh, ancient copies and so on. Uh, but it's well worth reading, and it, mm -hmm. it seems to me he's probably right. So that Marcion was the one that wrote the the first gospel uh, and the epistles. Uh, mm -hmm. That he had a rendition of them. And Tertullian actually says 
when Marcion discovered the epistle to the Galatians, he did this and that and the other thing. Well, now that could just mean when he got his first reading of it, I admit that, but I can't help like you uh, thinking that it's like Joseph Smith discovering uh, the uh, the Book of Mormon or uh, the priests in Josiah's time discovering the book of Deuteronomy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found it uh, under the old Sunday school ledgers. Yeah, I'll bet you did. Uh, yeah. And uh, because it's part of the genre to say it's an old book and uh, not just uh, not just something I whipped up and the yeah. uh, same as it's all pseudepigraphy. That's why anybody does it. So uh but I don't think Marcion wrote all of them necessarily. Like uh, Colossians strikes me as as simplified Valentinianism, uh, and uh, there's nothing in there that doesn't sound Gnostic. The uh, that Christ has the fullness, the plur the pleroma of God in him. And so, oh wait a minute, uh, and uh, so forth. Um, First and Second Thessalonians appear to be uh, much later works that are not particularly Gnostic, but have to do with their their damage control jobs because of the delay of the parousia. Anybody could have written that. Um, obviously, the pastorals are part of the uh, the uh, Catholicizing uh, layer. Um, so I don't know that he wrote uh, all of them, but but he could easily have written uh, at least part of Galatians and Romans, because then you have to get into, are these even unitary texts? And I tend to go along with von Manen and say, well, no, they're not. Uh, in fact, if you look at 1 Corinthians, uh, without the harmonizing instinct, you begin to realize that each chapter refutes the one before it. Can you eat meat offered to idols or not? Can women speak in the assembly or not? Uh, should you speak in tongues or not? Uh, should apostles uh, get uh, reimbursed by their congregations? Yeah, but no. Uh, what is what's what is this? Uh, and uh, do we we don't preach uh, sophisticated wisdom, uh, but among the mature we do. Like it just sounds like somebody has heavily interpolated this to sanitize it, either in a Gnostic or an anti-Gnostic direction. So I'm with Van Man, and I think uh, the epistles are are uh, patchwork quilts, and. Uh, so we're you got the same problem with the historical Jesus. Uh, what was the historical Paul? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so that work you reference, would you think Luke came before Mark, or well, no, I take that back. Marcion's work came before Mark, Luke, and Matthew, or um, yeah, I think that. So Marcy, because Marcion's the first gospel we have a copy of, and then we have the other traditions, which I don't know, um, there may have been various oral traditions that fed the various different communities. Right. Each one definitely seems to be to a specific community. Um, and the interesting thing that, uh, that I became aware of is that the first community to widely distribute the gospel of John was Marcion's community, um, which the views tend, you know, they're more Gnostic and they deify Jesus a lot more than you're going to find in Mark and the earlier Mark where it doesn't have the virgin birth or the res resurrection. Right. Um, so there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, that's where I can't subscribe to like at Will's theory that they were all four made up at one time. There's just too much divergence. Yeah. I, I can't accept that. And uh, by one that Josephus wrote them all. I think that's what he says in uh, Caesar's mm -hmm. Messiah. Uh, that just makes no sense to me. But I see influence of maybe Marcion writing, rewriting Paul's life in the vein of Josephus, that maybe there's that, a connection there. That could um, be. So what? Well, the, the problem there is that Acts generally is anti-Marcionite. It, it seems to me by it is heavily Catholicizing. Uh, yeah. Let's paper over the differences. Let's make Peter yeah. sound just like Paul, and vice versa, and, and so on. So that's a problem. And and uh, when uh, you know when 
Paul wants to go to Pontus to preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit says, oh, hold on a minute there, Paul. I don't think we want to go there. Why? Because that's where Marcion was from. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when Paul in chapter 19, uh, 18, 19, is given his farewell address to the Ephesian elders in Miletus, uh, he says, now, I know that among you and in this area, all kinds of heretical wolves are going to come around, uh, uh, siphoning off sheep from the flock, uh, uh, teaching weird things. Who's he talking about? Oh, probably the Enpertites, the Marcionites, the Gnostics, and all those guys who were at home there. They, they all appealed to Paul, we know from other writings. And Luke, whoever, Polycarp, knows that. And he's got Paul saying, look, don't blame me. When this happens, remember, I told you. And it seems to me that it's it's anti-Marcionite. Uh, Joe, uh, something about Luke Axe's anti-Marcionite. Uh, oh, I just don't remember his name. Oh, that's real. That's a lot of help. Um, um so um Luke Acts, I mean Acts definitely seems to be proto-Orthodox or Catholic rewriting, trying to make Paul well, I, let's preface this. I think Paul was going into disfavor when Marcion found it and brought him into favor. And then Luke Acts, my idea is that Luke Acts was written by a proto-Orthodox who had seen Marcion as a heretic, uh, mm -hmm. well, because they rejected him as a heretic. And so then they tried to take Luke there in, I guess, as you said, Catholicize or, you know, redact it and add on Acts as a way of rehabilitating Paul uh, you know, and getting him where they could distribute him to the rest of uh, the various communities that, because the by the time we get to the fourth century and they try to make it a universal uh, church, uh, they've, they've got to harmonize the message that they can get everybody to buy in mm -hmm. when they were in total divergence. Um, so I think that Marcion invented something and then the proto-Orthodox redid it and then acts as their justification for taking Paul when the earliest the Ebionites rejected Paul. Mm -hmm. So they're like, how do we have a religion that's based on Paul when the earliest followers rejected Paul? And I think that Marcion was the catalyst and the proto-Orthodox and then Catholic just took it further. Um, what do you think of that theory? I guess? Oh, yeah. And and the that's the origin of the New Testament canon uh, period. Uh, Marcion was the first to come up with the, the idea. I mean, once he rejected the Old Testament as a non, not as a bad book, but as not a Christian book. Uh, and I mean, he believed that the uh, creator God was the Old Testament deity. He gave the law to Moses. He wasn't a bad guy, but he was a pretty rough customer. Uh, he The Jews were his chosen people, and he would send a messiah to liberate them great more power to you but that's not jesus that's not christianity that's not the gospel and it's all been screwed up because the 12 were such dimwits as we see <laughs> screamingly uh in in mark's gospel just a bunch of idiots that are only there to be corrected and uh and so the under that influence, uh, the uh, those who looked to the twelve as their figureheads uh, said, uh, "Oh well, uh, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah." Yeah, yeah. And so we have to keep the Jewish scriptures. And uh, and uh, but uh, this uh, this Marcion guy. It's not a bad idea to have a uniquely Christian scripture, too, but his is a little uh, dicey. Uh, how about if we come up with some other gospels to add and and uh, some other apostles? It was slim pickings, but uh, these three letters, they're anonymous. Let's say they were John's. Uh, here's one by somebody named James. Here's a couple that are supposed to be by Peter. Here's one that's by somebody named Jude. What the heck? Uh, let's uh, connect them up with these Bible characters. 
and uh, they're not much, but they're not Paul, so we can have the whole group. And as for and uh, as for Paul, let's uh, let's dull the edge there. Let's have three Pauline epistles that will create a conventional Paul, uh, an ecclesiastical Paul. And uh, but how are we going to square them? In fact, I suspect they were originally intended to replace the the uh, larger canon of Pauline epistles, but couldn't do that. So they interpolated those. Uh, Winsome Monroe's great book on that authority in Paul and Peter uh, goes into that in great detail. And she says there's a pastoral stratum through the rest of the, the epistles. And, uh, it, and it's pretty easy to spot them once you know what you're looking for. And so with this, they uh, Polycarp, according to uh, David Trobish's theory, created the uh, 27 book New Testament, including Revelation, but it took quite a while for everybody to jump on the bandwagon, like uh, with uh, Athanasius's Easter encyclical, it said, okay, everybody, from now on, it's these 27 books, get it? And of course, the point was that the people that delivered these would be back eventually to make sure you had destroyed copies of anything that wasn't on the list, which is why we have the Nagamati texts, right? These guys said, uh, we're not burning these, let's hide them. And mm. uh, But then even there, it was like uh, uh, till the sixth century before the Eastern churches would accept the book of Revelation and the Western churches would accept Hebrews. And finally, they compromised. Well, all right, if you'll accept ours, we'll accept yours. And even then, there, even today, like in the Armenian uh, Orthodox Church and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, they got several more New Testament books than anybody else. So it's never even been closed. People yeah. think, oh, yeah, it's all sewed up. Uh-uh. Yeah. Um, okay. So, like, the canonization, like, one of the earliest uh, full New Testaments we have was Codex Sinaiticus. Um, and that has a lot of the, the New Testament. I believe it also has one Clement. Uh, I'm thinking they're the Shepherd of Hermas. And mm -hmm. I think another one that was Barnabas, at least. Is it Barnabas, right? yeah. And mm -hmm. then there was one I saw on a canon list, and it was Paul and some philosopher, but it's not in the uh, Paul canon. and Seneca. Seneca, that's what it was. That's Paul and Seneca. Those there was those four texts in it. Um, I have your uh the uh pre-Christian or pre-Nicene New Testament. Mm -hmm. Uh you didn't have uh one Clement or Shepherd of Hermas or Barnabas in here, do you? Or oh yeah, I have Barnabas and the Shepherd of Hermas. I think you have Barnabas, yeah, yeah, but not one Clement. No, no. Uh, the, uh why'd you leave that one out? Um well, uh partly because it's deadly boring, uh, but uh it somehow seems to me to belong almost genre-wise to a later stage of things. Mm -hmm. It seems to me you're already in the uh, uh, the uh, early Catholicism, whereas you've got New Testament type stuff going on in the others. Like Barnabas, I have in there partly as Paul of part of the Pauline circle, even if it's a pseudepigraph, because of course I think most of the Pauline letters are. And it's, con I mean, if you really want to get down to it, it's conceivable that it was by Barnabas, though I don't think so. Mm. Uh, and uh, it, it also, the teaching of it is a little, uh, I think it's sometimes misrepresented as being a bit more radical or nearly anti-Semitic than it is. And that's kind of interesting. A lot of the stuff criticizing the Old Testament is very much like what you have in Jeremiah, uh, that they're false pericopes and uh, belief in commandments that God never gave and so on. But um, plus, it's like uh, a la 
Crossan in his terrific book, The Cross That Spoke. It, it looks like the kind of stuff Barnabas has, these testimonia, uh, are raw materials for the Gospels in, in an early formative state. So it seems to me to actually fit into the body of it. And Shepherd of Hermas will... Uh, Origen thought that ought to be in the New Testament, and, mm -hmm. and it is sort of raw, early apocalyptic stuff. And so if you got the book of Revelation in there, I figure, well, here's another one. And it also serves to indicate that it was a whole genre. Um, and like I'm thinking partly of something that uh, Benjamin W. Bacon said once, he did this fascinating article arguing that the book of Revelation was written by one of the these prophesying daughters of Philip. Uh, and, and it's kind of far out, but, but interesting. Um, but, the, uh, but the thing was, the reason I mentioned it is, he said that he thinks that the revelation of John is pseudepigraphal, and if it's not, it's the only example of an apocalypse that has the author's real name on it. That's part of the genre to be pseudonymous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought, boy, that is interesting. I mean, how early was this? And the Christology uh, seems to be very early. It's sort of adoptionistic. Uh, fascinating. I mean, to me, this is like Christianity still in the uh, in the furnace being uh, smelted and molded. So I uh, stuck it in there. Yeah. Um, OK, so you mentioned something. All right. So as it's being formed, you know, uh, I felt like Paul was falling into disfavor. Marcy and, you know, brought him back. The proto-Orthodox are like, this is great. We actually can sell our snake oil with this. Um, <laughs> And that's a that's a rough analogy, but um, and then once it starts to become recognized by Constantine, and uh, you know he, Constantine, uh, I've seen estimates that he's he uh, appointed a, a thousand to eighteen hundred bishops, and gave them the power to declare heretics and excommunicate, and the policy of Rome to censor uh, things they didn't agree with. So like now. Paul was in disfavor, but then he becomes the message, and then the state power is able to declare heretics and censor and burn and um, destroy anything that is not because the winners write history. Um, my question is, I have a lot of questions about whether Constantine converted, and if that's later apologists trying to say he did. Uh, when really his vision of the Cairo uh, more had to do with soul invictus and he conquered in the name of henotheism, maybe a belief in one God or something, but I don't know if Constantine was truly converted, um, but Christianity became something he could unify the empire and kind of cajole the masses. Um, I mean, what do you take of Constantine's conversion and influence? That's my suspicion also, because there are four different ancient accounts, I think more or less contemporary, of the Milvian Bridge vision and all that stuff. In two of them, um, it's, uh, it's the Cairo emblem he sees, and in or some emblem, and in two of them, he's converted to Christian faith because of it. Uh, and it's a little odd to leave. This is one of those things where the less spectacular version almost has to be the, the original. Uh, and uh, because afterward, he didn't shrink from uh, functioning as the Pontifex Maximus of Soul Invictus. I mean, can you imagine Paul uh, going along with that? Uh, it's uh, and and uh, he um, he continued that along with being the head of the church, mm -hmm. and um, uh, he must have been some kind of uh, had some sort of Christian allegiance because we're told that he had people hunt for the relics of the twelve 
and put them all on platforms and with the one at 12 o'clock uh, being reserved for him, uh, implying that maybe he was the vicar of Christ. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, he must have uh, identified with Christianity. I mean, I, I, I gather he let it be known that he agreed with Athanasius, not Arius. So they, if they knew where the bread was buttered, they better vote that way. So he must have had a foot in it. But I, I suspect, and I've read this as a theory, that he was raised as a Christian of some kind. But who knows what that meant? I mean, we're told that Oh, what's her name? Uh, the wife of one of the Roman emperors had a chapel where she had statues of Orpheus, Apollonius of Tyana, Jesus, and Moses. Uh, well, there's a kind of syncretism, and uh, Constantine may have been born in that kind of uh, environment. So I, I suspect he was not converted, just like I'm not so sure Paul was converted that he came from, I mean, Romans 16 says he had family members who were Christians already. Uh, I heard Bart Ehrman say on a podcast recently that uh, his father was a henotheist. He believed in one God and that he may have converted to being a henotheist. Um, Paul or but, Constantine? Uh, Constantine. Uh -huh. Constantine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are you familiar? Okay, so there's the the Roman Imperial Codex, the Codex Theo. Uh, let me see if, see if I say this right. Theodosianus, which was like a compilation of the Roman Imperial policies in support of Roman Catholicism. Um, uh, are you familiar with that? Not very. Not at all. Okay, I've heard of it really, and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was just curious if you had heard of that, but their policies in support of, you know, Christianity and stamping out anything that wasn't. So I kind of want to circle back on kind of a final question trail. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the Ebionites. Uh, James Tabor made a comment, um, or James Tabor, um, that the Ebionites are like the most authentic witness to who the historical Jesus may have been. Uh, I mean, how do you feel about that? That's uh, entirely plausible, but it's one of a number of equally plausible ones. Like, I think slightly, well, I'm not sure what he thinks of this, but I am very impressed by the idea that Jesus was some kind of zealot revolutionary, uh, that uh, I think the, oh, uh, uh, the first modern era person that argued this was uh, Samuel Hermann Reimarus, an 18th century deist. And uh, he made a pretty good case for it. And then Robert Eisler did this huge book on, on it, uh, employing the Slavonic Josephus and what it says about Jesus. And then um, S.G.F. Brandon wrote a book uh, called The Fall of Jerusalem and the Christian Church or something like that. And then another one called uh, Jesus and the Zealots. And uh, I uh, I find the arguments there very striking. Uh, I've, uh, I kind of uh, say these days that I'm torn between Christ mythicism and, and the Zealot hypothesis. Uh, the, I leave out the, this guy, uh, uh, Aslan, uh, wrote something about the, Reza Aslan, the, yeah, the, yeah Jesus. The yeah, Zealot. it's just a ripoff of a brand and without acknowledgement. It's and where it's original, it's stupid. Uh, but uh, these guys, uh, who knew what they were talking about, uh, they made a, an interesting case that. A lot of odd things, again, uh, that it's like the, there's smoke, but people are busy denying that there's fire. Like the, the cleansing of the temple, the way it's depicted in Mark, it couldn't have happened. Uh, the, the court of the Gentiles, where it's placed, is the size of several football fields. Uh, if, that, if that's where this really happened, then you must uh, assume that Jesus had a large group of armed men and that he was probably trying to loot the treasury for weapons. 
uh, because it says he wouldn't let anybody bring the, the vessels back through the temple. Yeah, what was he doing? He was saying, hey, you, keep that stuff out of here. He must have had an armed force. Later on, uh, when Barabbas is introduced, it said that he, uh, he uh, committed murder during the insurrection. Uh, what insurrection? Uh, the one at the temple, maybe? Uh, and uh, the fact that Jesus at the Last Supper tells him, look, if you don't have a sword, sell your shirt and buy one because you're going to need it. Uh, and then just after that, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane where a sword fight breaks out abortively. Uh, the, the disciples are ready to defend him with swords. Uh, and, and Jesus manages to stop it. He says, no, put your sword away. Uh, I'll come peacefully. And then the fact that his disciples, uh, Judas the Iscariot, that could mean about three different things, but it could easily mean the Sicarius, the, the dagger man, um, uh, Simon the Zealot. Well, that's attested as the name of a political group uh, a little bit later, but you can't assume that's the first uh, that it was invented on the on the spot. It may already have been used as a. And even Peter Simon Bar Jonah. Well, Jonah is unusual as a patronymic in those days, but uh, there was another assassin group called the Bar Jonim, which means the extremists or the outsiders. I think Oscar Coleman translates it the terrorists. Uh, and Peter, of course, is the guy with the sword that that tries to cleave the skull of, of the. Uh, I admit, and, and he, how does Jesus die? It's not a cup of hemlock. He's crucified as the man who would be king. Are we yeah. sure it was a frame up? Uh, so I, I, I have to again think there's smoke, but there's no fire. It does yeah. seem to me that's a pretty good case. But mm -hmm. then so is mythicism. So I don't know. I, I don't know that if this will ever be resolved well, for me. You don't know. You don't know which one's more compelling. Um, well, the. So the Ebionites were a branch of the Essenes, which were, uh, doesn't Josephus connect? Um, the, Cause he, uh, he has his list of the three and then he adds a fourth. Um, the fourth philosophy. Yeah. Uh, of Judaism, you know, uh, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Essenes. And I believe the fourth one is the Zealots, but was the Zealots a branch of the Essenes? And uh, well, is there... Well, we're, he mentions, I believe it's he, uh, that uh, during the the uh, Roman War, one of the leaders of the zealots or whatever they were called was John the Essene. Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, from what we know of both groups, it's possible they were simply the same. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a book by Cecil Roth, um, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are in the title, I forget exactly what it was, maybe it was who wrote, no, that was somebody else, but he says uh, from everything we're told about the, the Essenes and the Zealots, they, they sound so similar, they may have been the same, um, in fact, you know, there's the war scroll at Qumran, mm -hmm. and uh, it looks to me like if there is a shade of difference between the two, it's just that the Essenes were quietists waiting for God to light the fuse. And when the angels descended, then they were ready to go uh, with the weapons and even ornamentation for the horses in battle. I mean, the thing gets down to so many details as to their military thing. Um, whereas the zealots may have figured, no, as long as we're sitting on our butts, God's not going to do a thing. We have to, to spark the fuse. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the only difference. And uh, so in effect, they would have been the same. And that what you're saying, of course, I think I get your point that if the Ebionites were connected with them, then maybe that's compatible with the, uh, the King Jesus approach. Does um, 
does Tabor, I've read that book, but it was a long time ago. Does he make Jesus a revolutionist? Um, he, he focuses, I guess, more on the, uh, caliphate or the dynasty of Jesus, I guess, mm -hmm. the family, the royal lineage. Um, I don't, I, I, I have the book. I'd have to look. I don't remember. Yeah, me too. I, I remember guess. references to Zealous, but I, do, I don't think, I don't recall it going that deeply into that. So I, I'd have to look at it again. Um, well, you mentioned the fourth philosophy. I don't think Josephus calls it the Zealots, but it was started by Judas of Galilee, uh, who was basically a zealot. Uh, and uh, Richard Horsley has tried to deny that, saying that uh, when they were uh, putting their lives on the line, it just meant they were like Gandhi. They would, uh, uh, they would die for their cause as martyrs. But I don't think so, because it's pretty clear from Josephus that that uh, Judas of Galilee was the patriarch of a line of, of revolutionary messiahs, Menachem and, and these other guys. So I, I think he's engaged in special pleading because of his own political inclinations. But it seems to me that they probably were called zealots. And if not, there was no real difference except nomenclature. Well, and I think that, but the zealots were connected to the battle in the Jewish Roman war at Masada. Uh, they were the ones that, you know, like that final salvo that they were fighting in, in the war there. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, if it, if any way the historical Jesus, the Ebionites, the Essenes were connected to the zealous, um, that may be where the traditions come from. And then they kind of fall out after the, you know, destruction of the temple. And there's a lot of different things that happen on the journey away from what may have happened but uh, you know with the censorship we'll never know fully what actually happened and that's where historical archaeologists you know try to put it all back together mm. so well this but, uh, motion, go ahead uh, go ahead with joe atwill and others anyway uh, the, the idea that the romans cooked up pacifistic christianity uh, that seems a little wacky to me, but it's only a notch over from something that is entirely plausible. Uh, because, I mean, if they were a subversive group, uh, could they have gotten away with saying, "Oh, we're uh, we're just the Moose Lodge here. We're we we pose no threat to Rome." Uh, could they have done that? Well, uh, yeah, because that's essentially what the rabbis did, right? After the 70 AD thing, the Romans let them establish a new Sanhedrin that would be restricted to religious matters. They could have killed all these guys, but they decided, now, as long as you swear off troublemaking, go ahead. Well, that's really all Brandon's theory about Jesus as a revolutionary implies, that uh, the Christians uh, voluntarily said, well, uh, Jesus, like even Judas of Galilee was a rabbi. He wasn't Che Guevara. And uh, so if Jesus could have been a revolutionary, would-be Messiah, and had a lot to teach. So even, just like Judaism, well, let's forget that Messiah, that violent revolutionary stuff and just stick with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and uh, that makes perfect plausible sense. So I, I think uh, Joe uh, is has made it a little too hard to accept, but it's only a nuance of difference. So that I mm. even there, I think the revolutionary thing sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, and that was short lived too, because then you have the Bar Kokhba revolt. So even though they sought to pacify them. And that's why that's where I have my layers of redaction when I look at it. What the between 70 and 130, uh, that was the pro-Roman influence, I would say. And then after the destruction of the temple, well, not, not the after the Bar Kokhba revolt, you have Marcion, and then you have the proto-Orthodox response, and then you have the capitalization that happens. And I, that's kind of how I, I see the the origins, I guess, there. Um but yeah, yeah I mean, any, uh, go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, we're told that Bar Kokhba persecuted Jewish Christians that wouldn't go along with them. So mm -hmm. that tells us that uh, it was a 
a recrudescence of uh, violent messianism, but not from the Christians. Uh, and there have been plenty of messianic uprisings. Uh, the other thing, are you familiar with Hermann Dettering's article about how the, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew's version fits the time of Bar Kokhba rather than the 70 AD ruckus? I am not, but that is interesting. Oh, oh boy. He says that uh, Mark uh, may have been readjusted to fit 70 in retrospect, but that this, this document, he or whoever pasted into the gospel, um, was must still have been circulating in its original form, and Matthew had one too, and he decided to just stick with it basically and not make the changes Mark did. And he says all the stuff about the earthquakes, the famines, the pestilences, and all that. He says we have a pretty good idea what was going on in the first century and in the second, uh, and uh, the stuff uh, in Josephus, etc fits the second century more than the first. Uh, I uh, um, published this in the Journal of Higher Criticism. I think I can uh, dig it up online somewhere and send it to you if you like. Yeah, 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 send me that for sure. Uh, it's really fascinating. This guy, unfortunately gone now, a dettering, he, he was also... Uh, a partisan of the Dutch radical uh, critics like Van Man, and uh, he he taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. I think he was the most brilliant New Testament scholar of his time. He was incredible, and he was a pastor. He wasn't even a professor. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this has been uh, very informative, like always. Um, any final thoughts on uh, the topics we covered today and anything you kind of want to end it with today? Oh, uh, well, it just as always for whoever sees this, uh, please remind yourself that I am not trying to win converts to my theory. Uh, my goal is always Socratic to raise questions for people to mull over and come up with their own answers and to provide information they might not have run across so they can add that to their synthesis and make of it what they will as, as that's what i've prospered from doing and and i i want others to to be stimulated the same way okay that's great uh is there any projects you're working on and you know where can people find you online if they're looking for you these days I have a website, robertmprice.mindvendor.com, and it's got like an archive of articles, sermons, short stories, movie and book reviews, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, I have a uh, a couple of newish books, uh, Judaizing Jesus, uh, where I take on the almost universal assumption that you have to assume Jesus was a kind of an Orthodox Second Temple Jew. As a wait just a minute, that you, you're doing that's an ecumenical bargaining chip, not a mm -hmm. historical uh, estimate in my view. Then another one called uh, "When Gospels Collide." Uh, where I show that, yeah, there are plenty of disagreements between the Gospels, maybe more than you ever noticed, but why are they there? Were the, go were the Gospel writers just a bunch of stupid idiots that couldn't get the story straight? It's just a bunch of dumb mistakes? No. You can show why they change things to make a new distinctive point, so you're cheating yourself if you're trying to harmonize them into one thing. So it's a weird kind of apologetic, oddly enough. Anyway, um, I have a book coming out from uh, uh, Pitchstone Publications, I think it is, probably, well, I'm pretty sure in 2024, called Houses of the Holy, uh, a higher critical survey of the world religions, where I do a kind of historical, critical, and theological survey of 12 religions, uh, the usual big five, and a bunch of other ones like Mandeans, Yazidis, and mm -hmm. Zoroastrians, and so on. Uh, that's going to be over 600 pages, so it's reasonably comprehensive. Then there's 
uh, one that Prometheus is considering now called The Heresy of Paraphrase, uh, uh, subtitled An Interpretive Rendition of the Gospels, where I try to do a kind of modern targum uh, of the Gospels, building okay. a, a possible interpretation into a loose translation. And there's some funny stuff and some thought-provoking stuff in it. And what the heck was the other thing that's been accepted? Uh, I can't quite think of it offhand. But anyway, I got all kinds of irons in the fire. All right. Well, definitely some interesting stuff to look out for. And um, I definitely want to thank you for uh, taking time. Very thought provoking. And um, yeah, same vein, you know, I want to provide information for people to question and seek truth in, find information, you know, so I'm pulling the threads, the idea we're pulling the mm -hmm. threads uh, to, to, you know, provoke thought and more of an open-minded journey for people. Um, so I thank you uh, for this and uh, look forward to, you know, conversations in the future. You bet. Great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Have a great day.